wasn't created to bear it alone. Hear your invitation, let it all go. Good morning. Welcome to Waypoint. Happy Palm Sunday to you. Uh, you know, I have to tell you, having been in Israel two weeks ago to get back uh, and to have this Palm Sunday just feels different because uh, when you walk on the roads that, um, you know, coming down from the Mount of Olives and you walk up to Jerusalem, which we, we did when I was there both times that I've been there, uh, and you think about the crowds putting down palm branches, which we'll talk about in a little while, but it's an incredible thing. 
to, uh, to come to this place to celebrate Palm Sunday 2,000 years later and know that, that there was a real event where the crowds uh, uh, honored Jesus in a pretty spectacular way. And then the knowledge of what happened just a week later is pretty incredible. So as we come to this, this place this morning, uh, let me just pray for us as we come together. Father, we thank you that we can run to the Father, that you are full of grace, and that your forgiveness knows no bounds, Lord, that you pour it out to us moment by moment for the forgiveness of our sins and also the salvation of our souls. And we just thank you for that. And I pray, Lord, as we come into this season with Palm Sunday and uh, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter next weekend, that you would turn our hearts toward the cross, that you would uh, help us to see the places in our lives, the doors of our hearts and minds that need to be opened to you, to the Savior. And Lord, we just ask you to come in today and that you would do what you, only you can do uh, inside of us and together as a community. We just, uh, we thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up and worship. All right, I'm just getting y'all exercise. You can go ahead and sit down again. Sorry. I, uh, I forgot we were doing this, honestly. Uh, Palm Sunday, can't believe I forgot, but we're gonna have the kids come in here in a minute, but I just wanna read uh, on the front end of Palm Sunday. I wanna read, they're, they're, it's interesting that uh, this account is in all four gospels. Uh, so it was a pretty big deal. And there are only a couple of things, honestly, that are in all four Gospels. There are only a few things that are in all four Gospels. One miracle, feeding of the 5,000, is the only miracle in all four Gospels, aside from the resurrection. And then this is one event that's important enough to all four writers that they, they mention it. So here are the words of Matthew, Matthew 21 here. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the palm trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. I just invite you all to just reflect on that passage as we sing together. You can stay seated and we're going to let the kids come in and, and bring the palms in. Church, we're going to just sing the same line every day. Over. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. Hosanna, 
church, can you stand with us? wondering why this door is in the middle of the room. Yeah, Wes isn't wondering why. Neither is Chip, because they put it there. So we get this uh, 
knock, this knock, this, this call, this, um, this invitation um, to be with the Lord. Um, he says, I knock, and if you, if you open the door, I'll, I'll come um, eat with you. <laughs> Some translations say sup with you. So, anyway. So, uh, yeah, so somebody comes over and knocks on our door, and they're ready to eat with us. Do we have space at our table? Do we open the door and invite them in? Do we open the door and invite the Lord into our table, as messy as it may be? Whatever we've prepared, um, whether that's just leftovers or fend-for-yourself type dinner, um, so yeah, so uh, the song is just about making room for the Lord in our lives. I 
Again, welcome to Waypoint. So glad you're here this morning. Thank you all for that song. That was a, that's a great Palm Sunday song. Here's my surrender. Just good to be in this place together. Uh, a few announcements for you. Um, I don't know how that one got back up there, but I'm going to. Um, the spring luncheon uh, for the women is going to be next, uh, two Sundays from now. So on the 16th at 1115 a.m. in Belk Atrium. Uh, I know that uh, Jessica sent out emails to the ladies. If you haven't gotten that, uh, please let us know. But would love for you to come to that. And that's just a chance for the women to gather and to talk about uh, kind of coming out of the retreat that we just had. Uh, kind of where we're headed in 2023 with women's ministry be a great chance to get to know some women if you're looking to do that uh, so 1115 in the atrium and we'd love for you to sign up you can hit that qr code in the middle of the plate or you can see it on the wednesday email and uh, or it's also on the uh, placard out there if you want to sign up that way i uh, would love to just mention a couple of events coming this week Ten and bray is a service that has to do with uh, uh, basically kind of the darkness and heading into easter weekend and the idea is that we'll have a candlelit service. We did this last year for the first time on, on the porch. Uh, it's a, just a great time to be together. I want to encourage you to come. I will tell you there's limited space uh, in the proceedings, so we would love for you to register so that we'll know uh, how many seats to put out and how to arrange everything. But we'd love for you to uh, come and join us at 717 uh, on Thursday. And again, you can hit the QR code. It's in the Wednesday email. It's also out there. Uh, and that is actually at our house, Emma, and, and my house on the porch. We'd love to have you come to that event. That's a great evening. Uh, lastly, it's, uh, Easter sunrise service. So the sunrise service is a great chance if you are looking to, A, avoid the crowd for 10 o'clock service, or you want to just come get up early, uh, as, the, as so many people did 2,000 years ago and found the tomb empty. I'd love for you to come and join us for the Easter sunrise service. It'll be right out front here. We'll have chairs out there. You can also bring camp chairs if you have something that you want to sit in. Uh, it's a great chance. We'll have the flowering of the cross where uh, we'll have, provide flowers, but you can also bring flowers and just put them on the cross. It's a great chance just to decorate the cross. Uh, and that will, again, be a great event. And then we'll also have the 10 a.m. service. I will tell you we expect parking to be a little tough next uh, Sunday. So if you want to come early or if you uh, have older kids and aren't trying to get into Rogers and then come here, we'd love for you to consider some other parking options, which, again, I'm not going to go through, but there will be in the Wednesday email. We'd love for you to consider parking in, in one of the two lots or on the street out here is actually pretty easy parking. I'd uh, love for you to do that. So as we come to this place, um, I don't know why these slides are in here twice. I'm very sorry. Confession. Um, this is the time in the service when we just turn our hearts to the Lord. And just say, Lord, we, we recognize that we come in here with hearts and heads full of stuff, even on a Sunday morning. Uh, sometimes getting here with kids is, is one of the toughest things you can do during the week. And so we just want to take a moment say, Lord, whatever's uh, going on inside of our hearts and inside of our heads, we want to just turn it and surrender it to you. So let's, uh, let's stand as we say this confession together. And we're going to give you 30 seconds after the confession. We'll give you 30 seconds just to, for you to be with the Lord on your own and to have some time to confess anything you need to. Let's say this together. Lord Jesus Christ, we confess that we can get busy with life and fail to spend time with you. 
We worry about tomorrow and do not see what you are doing today. We carry shame over the past and do not receive your forgiveness. May your love wash away our guilt. Lord Jesus, here is where we lay it down. Everything that is on the throne of our hearts that is in the way of you sitting where you rightfully should be sitting, we just ask, Lord, that you would remove it from our lives and remind us of your place. And so, Lord, we just say, here is our surrender. And we thank you for the grace that you give us. In the midst of confession, you come right behind us with a wave of grace and forgiveness to wash it away. We thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, and we thank you that we can come to you, the God of the universe, who knows our name and cares about what's going on in our lives. And we thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. As we've said, you've probably heard it before, if you're a visitor with us this morning, I want to make sure you realize the offering is really for folks who call Waypoint home. And if you are a visitor, first time, whatever, please do not feel the need to, to uh, participate in this. Just enjoy the music and just have some more time to worship as we come to this Palm Sunday. Uh, and so the baskets will just pass through the aisles and you can just let them go. And uh, just glad you're here this morning. Thanks for being here.
Would you all pray for me? Pray with me. Father God, we come to you. Lord, we come to you. We surrender it all. For, Lord, we know that you will feed us. You will sustain us. You will nourish us. Lord, you say that your word is the bread of life. And so, Lord, I ask that you would speak this morning to our hearts. You would speak to my heart. That we would know that we are loved by you. So, Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing unto you, O God, Redeemer, Savior. We love you. We thank you for the time here. Amen. As Chip was reading us the Matthew version of the triumphal entry, this Palm Sunday, this day that millions of Jewish people were gathering in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago to celebrate the Passover And the day that our Savior, Jesus Christ, rode in on a donkey, he he closed with a line I have never noticed before and I was not prepared to preach on. So we're going to see where this goes. But it said in verse 10, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Allow this moment to stir your heart. Are, Are we stirred? By this, Or do we just watch children processing in with palm branches and think how cute it is and go on home to another Sunday? What would it look like to allow Jesus Christ to stir your heart? See, he's coming in. He was riding into a donkey. He was heading into Jerusalem to his hometown. The first place he rode into was the temple, the house of God, his home. As the son of God, he was heading towards his home. And he was coming there. He was coming into the home. And in Luke's version, as I was realizing the city was stirred, how it describes Jesus, as it says, as he looked over the city of Jerusalem, he wept. He wept. Two times in scripture, Jesus weeps. That is captured of Jesus weeping. One time when his friend Lazarus has died, he wept. The God of the universe weeps over death. The tragedy we feel. If you've lost a loved one, if you've experienced the death of a marriage, of a friendship, Jesus weeps with you. And then he weeps when he looks over the city of Jerusalem When he comes into this city on Palm Sunday, when everybody's waving branches and saying, Hosanna, Lord, save us, Jesus doesn't get all excited. He weeps for this city because he says in verse 41 of chapter 19 in Luke, it says, as Jesus approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it because he said, if you, even you had only known on this day, what would bring you peace? I want to invite you to picture this door as the door of your home, the door of your heart, that Jesus is riding into town, coming into your home, into your heart, and he's standing there knocking on the door. What's it like on the other side? What do you have locked behind the door? Is it healing? Well, what do you have locked behind there? What, what's going on inside your home, inside your heart? And what would it look like to allow him to enter in? See, today's verse, today's passage we're going to look at comes to us from Revelation 3.20. And maybe you've heard this verse before as an invitation, as an evangelistic invitation where it says, Jesus says, here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with him and he with me. What what is the door uh, of your heart? What is the door that is locked that Jesus is standing on and asking, let me in, let me in. Let me begin to feed you and sustain you and nourish you and transform you. But I think it's important for us as we look at this verse this morning to understand where does it come from in, in Scripture? 
to kind of zoom back and see the full passage of where this is. Because Jesus is talking about more than just standing at our door of our hearts. This comes to us from Revelation where Jesus is writing seven letters to churches. And so he's actually standing at a church door when he's knocking. And this is what he writes and John captures Jesus saying in Revelation 3. He's talking to this church of Laodicea. And he says, to the angel of the church in Laodicea, I write. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds and that you're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I've acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you don't realize that you're wretched. You don't realize that you're wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me a gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, a salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come and eat with him and he with me. That's where the invitation is coming. Jesus is saying, here I I am. In fact, that Greek word that is translated, if you've got your NIV Bible, it's translated as here I am. It, It can also be translated as look, see, Or if you've got an ESV Bible, a a closer translation is the word behold. Behold, I stand at the door and and knock. I love, I heard Andy Stanley, a preacher out of Atlanta once, do a phenomenal job of unpacking just that simple word of behold. To break the word apart. That simply says, be held. Behold, Jesus is standing at the door to hold you. Whatever lurks behind the door, Jesus is there to hold you. If you would just allow yourself to be held. Now, every Palm Sunday since we were over in Byron's, the last three or four years, I've, I, I've warned you all uh, about the symbol of these things. And yet y'all still hand them to your children and they still process in every single year that y'all are forgetting what I say these palm branches represent. Y'all are are forgetting that you're handing your children signs of a revolution. The palm branches being weighed as Jesus came in were the signs of a revolution, of a new way the people of God were going to start living counter to the world around them. And yet every Palm Sunday, y'all still line up to give your kids these palm branches. So I hope you're wanting God to make a revolution in your heart, to transform you. Because see, Palm Sunday, what was happening on Palm Sunday was there was a convergence, a confluence of people coming to town, coming into Jerusalem, From the west, it was the Passover feast of Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem's population was to increase to millions of people were coming into town to celebrate the Passover. And so Pilate, a Roman general, a Roman soldier, would be rolling into town from the west because they were terrified. The Romans were terrified of this revolution and a rebellion. And so they were rolling into town from the west. And Pilate would roll in on a white stallion with his army behind him with swords and shields and power and might. And then the people in town were getting excited because all of a sudden it was like the Super Bowl and everybody was coming to town. So the merchants were getting excited and they began to flood the temple courts. And the merchants were thinking, man, this is my chance to make some money. It's time to make hay. Let's get to work. So the town was flooding with people. And that's the moment when Jesus comes in from the east. And he went on a white stallion. 
He was on a donkey. And his people weren't carrying swords and power and might. They were carrying palm branches and crying out, Hosanna, which literally means save us. Save us. So as this convergence of people are coming to town, who is knocking on your door? And who are you letting in? The powerful, mighty pilot people? The the merchants trying to make an opportunity of this? Or the lowly Savior coming into town? So Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door of your home and knock. Who are you going to let in? He he stood at the door of the church of Laodicea. I was listening to a great podcast called Bema that Pete's guys put on, uh, introduced to me. And I would highly recommend this podcast. It is a phenomenal job of unpacking the cultural image of what's going on in the Bible. It's a great podcast. And their podcast about this letter to the church in Laodicea is a phenomenal podcast because it kind of highlighted three things for me, three parts of the story. If you notice, there's three things Jesus is speaking to the church. First, he's telling them, you're, you're lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold. Then he's telling them, you think you are rich, but I tell you, you're wretched. And then he's inviting himself saying, I'm standing here. Let me in. Let me in. See, the first thing he says is, Jesus says, I know your deeds. I know what's going on behind that door. I know what's going on in your heart, in your life, and the darkness. I know your deeds, and you're neither hot nor cold. I wish you were one or the other. But because you're lukewarm, I'm going to spit you out. Now, I don't know if you were like me growing up in youth group and campus ministries and different things. I had been taught that verse was saying that Jesus would rather I was either all in or all out. That Jesus was saying, I'd rather you be all in hot or, or be cold. I don't want you fence sitting. But, but I, understanding and Bama helped me see that that's not what Jesus is getting after. Jesus was painting together this picture Where there was in Laodicea, there are two surrounding towns, Heropolis and Colosseia, where where in Heropolis they had hot springs. Colosseia had cold springs. And Laodicea was in between the two. And their water was lukewarm in comparison. And Jesus is saying, look, there's benefits to hot water and cold water. I've started to take ice baths and have begun to uh, discover the joy uh, of an ice bath, believe it or not. But, But an ice bath can be invigorating and refreshing. It can kind of pop you uh, alert. And a hot tub, I could sit and soak in a hot tub for hours. It's relaxing and restoring and healing. And so what Jesus is actually driving at here is he's saying, look, is your life helping to restore and heal broken people? Or is your life helping to invigorate and refresh people? People who need a challenge and push. Today at the end of the service, we're going to introduce the new partners to Waypoint. And they took uh, took a test of spiritual gifts. And for those of us, for those of y'all who are joining the church, look at it through that lens. That are you being a shepherd? Are you helping to bring healing and restoration to our city? A hot tub, a place where people just want to soak and be around you because you're helping them feel restored. Or or maybe you have the gift of being an apostle, of invigorating, of helping us take this gospel into parts of our city that are in need of the gospel. See, Jesus is challenging the church of Laodicea, challenging us, saying, are you going to be a place of restoration? Or are you going to be a place that refreshes people and invigorates them? Or are you just going to be a lukewarm church, just going through the motions? And then from there, Jesus goes on and says, you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and don't need a thing. See, what happened was there was a giant earthquake in the region And Laodicea and all these cities were kind of destroyed by this earthquake. 
And every other city took money from Rome to rebuild their cities. But Laodicea gathered the money amongst themselves and was proud that they had rebuilt the city on their own. So much so that archaeologists have found coins from Laodicea. They minted and made their own coins and stamped on it the phrase, we did it ourselves. Oh, man. We look at them, we laugh. We think how proud, how prideful, how arrogant. How much of our lives do we have stamped on it? We did it ourselves. How much do we live like that? We did it ourselves. Jesus is saying to you, you say I'm rich. I've acquired wealth and don't need a thing. You say I'm rich. I don't need a thing. But what the Lord wants you to see is you are wretched. Wretched. Poor. Pitiful. Blind. And naked. That's one of the things I love about this church. Y'all have come to see, we have come to see our wretchedness. And we're willing to acknowledge it and share it with one another. Somebody once said, well, when we would worship over the sports complex, that the, the beauty of Waypoint is it's a church full of mis, misfits. Amen. You say I'm rich and I've acquired wealth and don't need a thing, but don't you realize that you're wretched? that you're in need of the gospel. You're in need of healing and hope and restoration. And that's, that's when Jesus shows up at your door, knocking on the door, saying, here I am, here I am. The third thing going on here uh, that Jesus is contrasting himself was in Roman law, there was a rule called Angaria, the Angarian Roman law, where a Roman soldier would knock on your door and you had to let him in, and he would stay at your house and eat your food. You were required to under Roman law. And so when the Roman soldiers and Pilate were coming in, they would go around town knocking on doors and take over a person's house by force. And so when Jesus is speaking, do you notice his is an invitation? If, if you open your door, I will come in. I will eat with you. As Eric said, what? I will sup with you? Sup. sup. And not like the teenagers sup. It's dine. It's eat. It's commune is actually the Greek word. It's the same word Jesus uses at the Last Supper when he says, uh, this is my body broken for you. This is my body I give to you. He wants to dine with you. So my question, Waypoint, is how far into your home are you inviting Jesus? How far into your heart are you inviting Jesus? I love this image I've had of picturing your house like one of these kind of mid-century modern sort of homes. This is like Lindsay and I's first ranch house we lived in in Beverly Woods. You know, where that front room, that kind of fancy living room, you know when you'd go visit your grandma and she would have that front room with the piano in it and that sofa you weren't allowed to sit on because it was white? The, the super fancy kind of room? Are you allowing Jesus into that kind of formal living room on occasion? Christmas and Easter and you're here Palm Sunday? Uh, just the formal... You know, when you show up at a person's house and you're just all hanging out in that kind of formal room, making small talk and then moving on? Or are you allowing him to go a little bit deeper into your den? You know, when people would kind of gather around, you gather together in your den uh, around an event to watch, like the NCAA. It's more relational, but it's also kind of just situational based. You're inviting Jesus to just kind of come in when you need him. Something to do, something to watch, something to be around. Or are you inviting them all the way back into the kitchen table? Into the kitchen table to sit there and laugh with you and to sit there and weep with you. 
We had one of the best dinners of our family on Friday night. My mom's in town and just watching my kids and my wife and I, we were just laughing over the dinner table. Are we inviting Jesus into the dinner table? An intimate place where we're known, where it's familial. And how far are we allowing the people around us to come into those places? To go just a little bit deeper into it. You see, the uh, amazing thing about Jesus is he stood at the door with a basket of food that he wanted to feed us. I come in and I dine with you. I sup with you. I eat with you. There's a great book called Nourished by Mark Moore that he describes that we worship a God who feeds us. And, and he writes and he quotes in that book. He says, I'm not, uh, he quotes God in this sort of sense. He says that I'm not a God who you have to feed. You don't feed me. I feed you. Mark unpacks it further. He says, look, you, you look through all of human history and what we've found are examples of people who try to feed their God that we know about the Aztec and the Mayan culture that tried to feed God, their gods through human sacrifice. And they had temples that in many cases fed their gods. And the ancient Greeks and Romans paintings and pottery depicted feasts for their gods. Norse and Celtic traditions were all full of God-feeding efforts as well. Everywhere we look throughout the ages and cultures, the similarities are shocking. We see people who seem to have a need to feed their gods. We did it ourselves. But God's plan ever since Genesis was to feed us, to save his people. He wants to feed your hearts. He stands at the door and knocks and wants to feed your soul. Whatever lurks behind the door it is because you are, are hungry. Hungry for the Lord. That his body broken for you, his blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins might feed your soul if you would just allow him to come in. So what, what happened to the church in Laodicea? The beautiful part of the church of Laodicea, of, of the seven churches, this one actually was refreshed and renewed and restored. That this is an archaeological dig they found of that early church, those columns there, but the thing is that the early church in Laodicea was somebody's home. It was a private dwelling place. And what they noticed was that it was a beautiful place, that it was the only place that was both used as a home and a place of business. And it was ex right next door to a theater. It was strategically located to have a place of worship, to have a place that impacted the marketplace, and to have a place that impacted the arts of a community. It was so much so that this first believers had to secretly worship in the place. And they built the house larger to welcome people in. And that from there, the church in Laodicea began to flourish and grow and impact the world. There's an early church council in Laodicea in the 300s in which they gathered. And there was the time in which they decided what books of the Bible would be in our Bible. That from that home that opened their doors helped to radically reshape Christianity and the church. And I believe that if we are willing to do that in our hearts and in our homes and our communities, that we will radically reshape our, our city, our country, Chimbote, the Cuba, the, the world around us. I was talking with the guys, well, they whispered at me during worship, but we were just talking about, they were part of the launch team, the trailblazers that helped to launch Waypoint, and to see the community that's been gathered here. And one of the most critical moments in the life of Waypoint's origin stories was a moment that Rudy and Sarah opened up their house to us, that it moved from being a group that met at Lindsay and I's home on Tuesday nights, and we began to meet at another home of leaders of this church. And we all who are gathered here are beneficial because of Rudy and Sarah's openness, because of Pete's and Libby walking through this, because of so many of y'all who are here as trailblazers. 
that if we allow God into our home, into the kitchen table, we will reshape our hearts, our homes, and our community. Thanks be to God. Amen. So today's Partnership Sunday. It's a day when we recognize and welcome the new partners into the life of the church. So if you are part of this partnership class, if you would come forward and stand up here. At Waypoint, we don't have membership. We have partnership. We're not looking for people to join a country club or to join some social activism movement. We're looking for people who are going to partner with us in the gospel. And I think this actually might be one of our largest partnership classes. Uh, I need the microphone. Eric, how long a chord did we make? It's long enough? All right. So I'm going to just invite y'all, if y'all would just introduce yourselves, introduce uh, your children. Uh, we got a sleeping baby, so we're going to try to see if we can, oh, no, I just spoke, it's eyes open, sorry. But just introduce yourself, uh, share with us your name, and let us know, maybe, maybe give us one thing Waypoint should know about you or your, and your family. Uh, Jack and Jillian Butler, um, fun fact, I guess we've been coming here for about four years, but now have officially joined, so better late than never. Uh, but uh, we uh, really we were drawn to Waypoint um, a few years ago just by the community, uh, by Wes. Um, we came to one service, our daughter was born early, and then we had about 20 people bring us meals after the fact and uh, just felt like this is where, where home was. So happy to finally make it official. Guess I'll talk. We've got the baby. Um, we're Logan and Charlie Humphreys. We have Emma, who's five, Owen, who's three, and um, baby Natalie, who's three months. Um, I guess our fun fact is kind of similar. We had Emma premature in Miami um, and had just, we had been to a church um, one time. It was very small. It was kind of like Waypoint, very family friendly. Um, and we had probably three months of meals brought to us. Um, so we moved here 18 months ago-ish um, and just have loved this church and have got a very similar feel. Love base camp, love the community and happy to be here. Hey y'all, uh, I'm Noah and this is Emily Satterfield. Uh, one thing to know about us, she's in med school up at Wake Forest, but now down in Charlotte, and then I'm the youth director here, so I get to join and work here, which is fun. Okay, yeah, hey, uh, I'm Chris Whitworth. Uh, you've probably seen me up here a couple times, uh, and really excited to be partnering, be a part of this. I'll circle back around at the end. Cool. Hi, Craig and Sherry Lee. We started coming here this past December, um, just looking for a new church. Um, we're, we're members in uh, First Baptist Matthews, um, but just found the special um, feeling. We came here the first time, and we knew it was the, the church for us. It didn't take us long to, uh, to make the decision, and uh, went to some meetings, and uh, just feel it's the right place, and excited to become a member, and get involved you know, with the activities, and communicate to everyone, and um, to make some lasting relationships with folks here. Good morning. Um, I'm Sumter Cox, my wife Ellen, my oldest Sumter the third, and we have a shy one on the second row here, Charlie, uh, who are 10, <laughs> who's 10. Um, we started coming a year ago next Sunday. It was our first visit to Waypoint, and immediately upon walking out, we we knew that we had found a home and are so grateful and appreciative of this community and the opportunity to, to plug in with this group and become partners. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Wes Hodges and this is my wife, Katie Hodges, and this is Gabriel Hodges and we have a eight-year-old daughter, Hazel, who's in base camp and I think Jaron uh, is back there coloring. He's our middle. Um, but we relocated from Atlanta back in 2019, and obviously it was a tough time to find a church uh, with the pandemic and everything. But anyway, we were invited to come to Waypoint, and uh, just the connectivity of the, the people, just um, we immediately got plugged in and made some great friends. And, and so it felt like home for us, um, and so we look forward to 
to give you know offering our gifts um, that we have to this church and uh, growing together. My name is Scott King, and this is my wife Catherine, our son William, who's five months, and then we've got Everett and Ellie Reed in base camp. Um, the first time that we visited was 2020, which was the Christmas COVID. Uh, it was the Christmas Eve service was the first time that we visited, and um, you know I'm going to refrain, you know, echo a lot of what everybody said, but I think it speaks the truth when everybody says the same thing. Just the community um, and how people were so welcoming, and how we felt at home, and are excited to. Uh, take the next step in our faith and our journey with the church and excited to be here. Good morning, um, I'm Jordan McAdams. This is my husband, Matt. Um, we have a three month old Sam and then two older little girls, Mary Lane who's six and Elliot who's two. Um, and we've just been praying so long, I feel like for a church where, you know, we just feel God's love. Um, and I just have to say Wes and, and the staff here and. We're just so thankful because we do feel that. Um, and I feel like our family's already been so blessed just by the time um, that we've had here. And we're really looking forward to um, joining and partnering with you all. Chris, yeah, if you, I asked Chris to just share what this community's meant. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I first uh, started coming last year. Um, happy to share my story with you guys, the longer version anytime, but um, you know, coming out of COVID, I'm, you know, single. The last church I was at, it was, hey, worship at home. Let, let God find you at your family. Um, when you don't have a family, it's kind of hard for that to happen. And it was really difficult for me. I've been friends with Eric for a long time, and he invited me to come uh, to Waypoint. And I had this text message <laughs> way too early to be this serious on a Sunday morning. But it was basically like, hey, man, I'm coming because... I trust you, I trust Chip. We had known each other for a long time, but I don't wanna be there. And his response to me was, my mom and dad are gonna be there, they love you, they're gonna look forward to seeing you. And it was like, okay, I gotta come. So, showed up, I was here, Wes decided to uh, start that morning, uh, I think we were in Matthew, and he said something kind of offhand that like blew me up. It was, hey, we're reading Matthew, and if you're interested, you can do this in a month with us. So. I took it, I ran with it, I started reading Matthew, then went into all the other Gospels, started over. It was what I needed to set myself on fire. And um, when he asked me, you know, why do you want to be a partner? It's, well, because I don't think my story's unique. I don't think my story's even special. So for all the people that are like me, that need the loving face, just the somebody that is going to be that thing that gets them in the door, I want to partner for that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Hearing their stories, uh, they have gone through a process where they have written out their faith stories. They have figured out what it is they believe uh, and um, have met with folks to have coffee, but I would also just an extend an invitation uh, of they are equipped for you guys to just reach out to them and ask them their faith, where Jesus has been, and maybe you can be encouraged or you can encourage one another. And so that's why we bring them forward to this place. And now partners... I'm going to ask you these three questions to profess your faith in front of this community. So here's my questions. Do you confess that you are created by God? You have rebelled against him through sin. And no matter how hard you try, you are a sinner. You, you are wretched, poor, pitiful, blind, and in need of God's grace. Do you? Do you believe that you can be rescued by God's mercy, only, that you can only be rescued by God's mercy through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that you'll never claim forevermore that you did it yourself? Therefore, who is your Lord and Savior? Do you surrender yourself to the Holy Spirit as a partner in this mission? acknowledging his calling to use you in the life to further his kingdom, to act as an apostle who leads the gospel out into our community, to speak as a prophet, speaking God's truth even when it's difficult, to act like an evangelist wanting to connect others to the good news, and to serve as a shepherd caring for the flock, to read the Bible in order to teach others the good news of the gospel, 
to be a place of refreshing, healing, restorative work in our city and to be a place that brings invigoration and excitement around the gospel. Do you? I was going to challenge you all to take a knee, but seeing all these babies, I'm going to pause on that. So in your mind, I want you to picture taking a knee. Because as a person taking a knee, it's a posture of surrender. I'll tell you what, I, I challenge you tonight to drop on your knees in prayer. Just spend a moment in prayer. But would you all just kind of gather together? Would um, the oversight team, if you all would come up here, we're going to pray over these folks. Oversight team is our, our leadership team. And just lay hands on one another. God of mercy, God of grace, I give you praise and thanks for these people, for the ways you have stirred in their hearts, and they are hungry, hungry to know you better, hungry to serve you better. I pray over their homes. Uh, I pray that they would be open places where people hurting and lonely can feel welcomed. I, I pray over their hearts that you would do a mighty work in them. And I pray over our city that it would be ready for what your spirit's wanting to bring out of this place. We give you praise and thanks. Amen. So here's my challenge. There are... With y'all, by the way, there are four people who couldn't be here today. Betsy Creech, Forrest Richardson, Emily, and Thompson Brock, who are all also joining the church. And so there are now 21 new church plants in Charlotte. You have been equipped to be a church, to be that home for other people in our city. So as you go home, make sure you're carrying the love of Jesus Christ with you. Amen. Waypoint, if y'all would stand up for the coordinates. I really like how Chris's message was that he actually did what I encouraged y'all to do. So I'll just let that sit there for you. But, but this is my question for you. How far into your home have you allowed Jesus Christ? How far into the mess? Where's that closet you keep locked and hidden in the back? that he's knocking on saying, let me in. Let me clean that place up. And my challenge for you is in order to let Jesus into your home, look around here and just invite two people to have dinner, to come around the table. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with you. So what would that look like this week? And as we head into Holy Week, as we head into the week that Jesus went from the temple where people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, and by Friday, he's hearing the cries of crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. I challenge you to be with us Thursday night and then gather together Sunday morning that we might claim he is risen. He is risen indeed. So may the God, our Father who created you, watch over you. May he protect you. May he shelter you. May he be a place of refuge in this crazy world. And may Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life show you the way back home to that Father's love. And may the Holy Spirit fill you with the love and the joy and the peace you need this day and forevermore. Amen. You guys, y'all have a great Sunday. I look forward to worshiping with y'all on Easter morning together.